make a stained glass earth. All right, so if you are doing this program through the Ridgefield Library, you will have a kit that looks like this. <laughs> Inside that kit are directions, very important, a template of the earth, two paper plates, some tissue paper in white, green, and blue, whatever colors you would like your earth to be, some glue, some wax paper, about this big, <laughs> about this big, very big. <laughs> How big exactly? It is nine inches big. And then you also get some bonus NASA stuff and stickers. You will need to grab a pair of scissors and something heavy. I'm going to use this very big Encyclopedia of Earth. You can check this book out from the Ridgefield Library and learn all about Earth. Or use it <laughs> to make your Earth. All right, now we're going to cut our paper plates. We're going to cut a big hole in the center. So for this, you'll need your plates and you will need your scissors. I'm going to stack mine on top of each other so I only have to cut once. Fast forward. Ta-da! Now I have two plates <laughs> looking at me like two eyes. <laughs> All right, so now I want to flatten my plates because my plates are sort of curving up a little bit. You can use a pencil to do this. I am going to use my giant earth book and just, whoops, let that sit <laughs> on top for a while and thoroughly flatten my plates. For the next step, we're going to get our tissue paper. And if you are using the heavy book method <laughs> to flatten your paper plates, you can do this while your paper plates are flattening. And what we're going to do is we're going to tear up our tissue paper into tiny little pieces like that. And I'm going to actually put them on top of my book. Now this is a task that's probably going to take you a little bit and it's something you don't really need to concentrate on. You can just sort of tear, tear, tear. So while we are all tearing up our tissue paper into tiny little pieces, I am going to read a book. <laughs> so keep tearing up all your tissue paper and you can listen to this story. So our book that we are going to read is a biography. So that means it is the story of a real person. And this person's name is Neil deGrasse Tyson. So even though the pictures are drawn instead of photographs, it is a true story. So this book is called Starstruck, The Cosmic Journey of Neil deGrasse Tyson. So this book was written by Kathleen Cruel and Ball Brewer, and it was illustrated by Frank Morrison. So that means that Kathleen and Paul wrote the words and Frank drew the pictures. Starstruck, the cosmic journey of Neil deGrasse Tyson. And then we have a quote here from Neil deGrasse Tyson. Everyone should have their mind blown once a day. Whoa, have you ever had your mind blown? You know what that means? It means seeing something so incredible you can hardly believe it. Mm. Sometimes I feel like that when I learn about space. Ooh. Our universe began its dance with what scientists call 
the Big Bang. After many millions of years of darkness, spots of impossible brightness, stars, sizzled into shape. Some grew so massive that they exploded, spewing stardust every which way. Boom. The stardust contained what was needed to create more shapes, more patterns, the planets, our whole universe. Zoom forward almost 13.8 billion years to the Sky Theater at the Hayden Planetarium in New York City. On the domed ceiling, the planets and constellations created by the Big Bang pulse against the black ink of space. Oh, have you ever been to a planetarium and watched a show about the stars on the ceiling? Nine-year-old Neil deGrasse Tyson had never seen so many stars. After all, from his apartment in the Bronx, it looked like there were only about 12. <laughs> now above him were what seemed like millions, too many to possibly be real. Was this a hoax? A joke? He wasn't sure, but when the lights came on, his thoughts began to explode. The universe called me, he said simply, and he would never be the same. Starstruck, Neil started looking up whenever he could. Even though he lived in an apartment building named Skyview, his view of the night sky wasn't very good. Too many bright city lights got in the way. His good friend Philip lent him a pair of binoculars. Neil used them to peer at the moonscape over the Hudson River, the glossy orb with its craters and shadows. And it came alive, he marveled. Look at that. So we can't see too many stars here in Ridgefield either. We can probably see more than you could in New York City but still not as many as way out in the country. But, like Neil, we can still look at the moon. On a family trip out of the city, away from all the lights, he was able to see more. Sure enough, the night sky really did look like the one at the Hayden Planetarium. It was real. The sheer wonder of it all, the blinding beauty, the mysteries just waiting to be solved, fascinated him. Neil was hooked. He had a whole new goal. Becoming a baseball player was out. Now he was going to be an astrophysicist, a scientist who studies the universe. Neil's parents weren't scientists, and they weren't rich, but they did everything they could to help. For his 12th birthday, they bought him a telescope. Atop the 20 stories of Skyview, he examined the night sky in all its glimmering glory. Neil's parents also bought him every science book on sale so he could learn about what he was looking at. Neil had one of the biggest libraries of any kid at school. His knowledge of the stars began to explode. The more Neil learned, the more he thirsted to know. But he needed a bigger, better telescope. One that cost more money than his parents could afford. Neil solved his own problem. He offered to walk his neighbor's dogs for pay. These were pampered city dogs with cute names like Tuffy. <laughs> it's a cute dog name, isn't it? On rainy days, some of them even wore their own raincoats and boots. <laughs> Look at those well-dressed doggies. 
Eventually, he saved enough money to buy a five-foot-long telescope with his parents' help. Neil headed back up to the roof. Sometimes, people saw him up there and were afraid. What was an African-American boy doing on the roof? Was his long telescope really a rifle? Was he an armed robber? Often, they called the police. Oh, that's not really fair, is it? Neil solved this problem, too. When the police officers stopped by, he would offer them the view from his telescope. He showed off the stars, like the powdered sugar flung against black velvet. He would point out his favorite planet, Saturn. Saturn just blew his mind. With its dozens of moons and its stunning elaborate rings, it was the most gorgeous thing he'd ever seen. The police officers would usually end up one over. It turned out Neil could make others starstruck too. Neil loved school. He loved to learn. But not every teacher was his fan. Your son laughs too loud, one told his mom. On his report cards, they complained that he spent more time talking to his friends than paying attention. But his sixth grade teacher noticed something. Every single book report Neil wrote had to do with astronomy. She told him about a class at the Hayden Planetarium, Advanced Topics in Astronomy for Young People. Neil took the subway to classes at the planetarium by himself. He was often the youngest person, and some information sailed right over his head. But he wouldn't quit, pushing himself to learn more and more. Neil's quest to understand the cosmos made him a young star at the planetarium. The director of education was so impressed that he invited Neil on an unbelievable journey to the coast of Northwest Africa. An ocean liner was being turned into a floating laboratory to view a total solar eclipse. 2,000 scientists and observers, including famous astronauts and science fiction writers, were making the two-week trip. At 14, his trusty telescope in hand, Neil was the youngest scientist on board. Observing and studying the eclipse alongside expert scientists made him feel like a science superhero. Then, on the way home, he won the dance contest and the trivia contest, thanks to his knowledge of Saturn, the perfect ending to his first expedition. <laughs> After passing tough tests, he made it into the Bronx High School of Science. He was a card-carrying nerd kid, winning the science fair prizes and subscribing to the brainy Scientific American magazine. In the lab, he was trying not to blow things up. In his physics classes, he was getting to know the universe. His life wasn't all science. He excelled at dance, from ballet to ballroom, and was captain of the wrestling team. He even used his understanding of physics to win his matches. When he was 15, Neil got to go to a summer astronomy camp in the Mojave Desert in Southern California. Scorpions, tarantulas, and howling coyotes? No problem. This was bliss. Days were full of classes on the subjects he loved. Nights were for observing with high-powered telescopes. So far from the city lights, the stars burst with more radiance and in much greater number than he'd seen since that first visit to the Hayden Planetarium. 
It was too inspiring for words. But with his dog walking money, he'd also bought a good camera for taking sky pictures. He used the camera to bring home the galaxies, constellations, moons, and planets he captured on film and shared his pictures with 50 adults at his first public talk at City College of New York. Was he nervous? No, talking about science was like breathing, and people liked his explosive excitement. A career in astrophysics was Neil's only goal. Many people noticed his ability and pushed him forward. Some didn't. He often had to cope with racism. Neil even had friends who thought a future as an athlete or a leader in the African-American community would be better goals for Neil than becoming a scientist. But Neil had a strength burning inside him, a flaming passion. He pictured it as a tank of rocket fuel, and every new discovery, like seeing Saturn through a telescope for the first time, poured fuel into that tank. By the time he was starting to pick a college, his reputation in the scientific community was growing. The most famous scientist of his day, the astronomer Carl Sagan, hoped to convince Neil to come to his school. One snowy February afternoon, Neil took the bus to visit Sagan at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. They talked nonstop about science while Neil toured the labs. Then Sagan drove the high school senior through the snow back to the bus station. In case the bus had trouble with the snow and Neil needed a place to stay, Sagan gave Neil his home phone number. Neil was touched, but he'd also heard many good things about Harvard University. And that's the school he chose. In college, he stretched his muscles by wrestling, dancing, and running up and down every single path through the seats at the campus stadium. He stretched his brain by inhaling physics, mastering equations, and experimenting. And he stretched his wallet, earning money by writing, teaching, and tutoring. After 11 more years of school, he earned the highest degree possible in astrophysics. He was literally one in a million. A star. Neil kept looking up, continuing his research, solving mysteries. Then, at age 35, he went to work at his beloved Hayden Planetarium, the very place where his dream had started. Eventually, he rose to become its director. One day, a TV station asked him to appear as an expert. He was happy to explain that day's news about a solar flare, a small explosion on the sun. Afterward, Neil was jolted. Quote, I'd never before in my life seen an interview with a black person on television for expertise that had nothing to do with being black, end quote. He made it his mission to be visible, letting his enthusiasm explode in public. He wanted to infect others with his sense of awe and wonder at the universe. Who wouldn't want to study it? As he learned more and more new things in his research, it made him giddy, wanting to grab people on the street and say, have you heard this? Then it was time for the Hayden Planetarium to update its display of the planets. Neil met with other scientists and looked at the latest discoveries, and in 2000, they made a stunning decision. Pluto, then the smallest planet, 
would no longer be labeled as a planet in the new solar system display. They decided it had more in common with smaller, icy objects than it did with other planets. Neil got hate mail from Pluto lovers everywhere, but he showed that the frontier of science can change as new facts get discovered. Six years later, the International Astronomical Union agreed with him. Pluto was demoted to a dwarf planet. No one has quite as much fun talking about science as Neil deGrasse Tyson. He is able to summon all that social energy his earliest teachers complained about. Fascinating facts tumble out, one explosion after another. He waves his hands and snaps his fingers. Laughter bubbles up, sometimes turning into a roar. Equations are awesome. The universe is hilarious. Certain equations make him misty. The sight of Saturn is simply jaw-dropping. He uses a lot of exclamations like, Whoa! <laughs> he has a strong opinion on just about anything scientific from the mystery of dark matter to the silliness of zombies. Quote, I have an odd cosmic thoughts every day, end quote, he says. Wearing one of his many star-themed ties, he has more than a hundred, he never gets tired of appearing in public and dancing with words to describe science. He also pours energy into articles, books, tweets, and TV appearances. While Neil is rocking the world of science, he hangs on to his memory of being a small boy having his mind blown under a starry dome. Sometimes when he's in a remote area and sees all those stars, he thinks, this looks just like the Hayden Planetarium. And when he goes outside, he still looks up. Quote, I don't want to ever lose that. In life and in the universe, it's always best to keep looking up. And then we have more information about Neil deGrasse Tyson here at the end. And we have the sources. So all the other books and articles the authors have used to make this book. The end. Great listening, everyone. All right, so we have our nice little piles of torn up tissue paper. I want to scoop them up top here because now we're going to get our template. So basically, a picture of the earth that we can follow along with. And I'll show you what I mean. So we're gonna get that. We're gonna get our wax paper. Put the wax paper on top. And now we're gonna get our glue. We're going to spread glue all over the top of the wax paper. <laughs> Cover it with glue. All this glue. Even more glue. Now, I'm going to put the wax paper on the spots and sort of follow along with my template. So I think I'm going to put the green wax paper, or the green, green uh, tissue paper, on top of my land masses here and here. I think this is North America and South America. Then I'm going to put the white tissue paper down here, where on my template I see the North and South Poles. You know what the North and South Pole areas are called? Yeah, the Arctic and the Antarctic. And then I'm going to put the blue where I see the ocean on my template. Oh, my fingers are getting so messy. <laughs> are your fingers getting messy too? <laughs> So this is also going to take a little bit. We're just going to 
put the glue down, not the glue down, the tissue paper down in the right spots. So I'm gonna speed this up. Fast forward. All right, <laughs> my oceans are rising off a little bit. <laughs> but I think that makes it kind of fun. You can kind of see I got Antarctica, got the Arctic, I got North America, South America, and I got a little bit over here. Oh no, my ocean. <laughs> so now I'm going to take the glue and I'm going to glue. Let me shift over so you can see. I'm going to put glue all over here and then I'm going to fold my wax paper over. So I'm just going to put so much glue, glue everywhere, all the glue. Now I'm going to fold it over. Yes, my masterpiece. <laughs> So I'm doing it in a little bit of a different order than the directions, just because my, my earth got a little sloppy and <laughs> it's not a circle anymore. So I'm going to put the frames on the outside. All right. So now I'm going to take my very big book and I'm gonna put it on top. And I'm going to let it sit there until it's nice and dry. All right, so let's see what we got. I'm gonna take off my big book. Ooh. Mine is still kinda wet. I think I used too much glue. <laughs> but you can see my earth. You can especially see it, yeah, once I get that nice frame around it. All right, so I am going to get my scissors and I'm going to cut uh, sort of around the earth there. I don't have to be exact because the frame is going to cover up any mistakes. So let's just cut, cut, cut. All right, ta-da. <laughs> Definitely don't use as much glue as I did. I might, I'm might. i gonna add a little note into the video so you will not make my mistake. Alright, so now I'm gonna glue it to the inside of my frame. So it'll sort of look like that. So I'm gonna get my handy glue. <laughs> I'm actually going to get some scrap paper so I don't glue to the table. All right, I got my scrap paper. Now I'm going to just put some glue around the edges here. There we go. I'm going to fit in my beautiful earth. I'm going to do another layer of glue. And tape the, or glue the rest of my frame on. There we go. Ooh, it's kind of 3D. Now I'm just going to wait for that to dry. All right, so now I have my beautiful stained glass earth. I can hang it in a window. I kind of like this curve here, though of course we want the classic. You can look at it from the other side. Mine is still, <laughs> it's still wet because <laughs> I used way too much glue. <laughs> but maybe yours has less glue and will dry a lot more quickly. <laughs> All right, everyone, I hope you had fun. We'll see you next time.